Ladies and gentlemen, I would kindly ask you to take seat so that we could continue with the breakout session this afternoon. So, let's start. Now I'm very honored and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to announce the next speaker of this afternoon session. So as a German, um, I think it's allowed uh, to announce a living legend now and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, announce Dr. Charles Ray Jones. Dr. Charles Ray Jones is graduated from New York Medical College, interned in pediatrics at St. Luke's Medical Center in Manhattan and became chief resident there. He went on to become attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Jones had moved moved to Hamden, Connecticut to practice pediatrics in late 1960s. Within a few months after arriving, he noticed cluster of patients diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis who really had Lyme disease. Since then, Dr. Jones had treated more than 10,000 children for Lyme disease from virtually every state and from around the world. Um, he will now hold a lecture about pregnancy and tick-borne diseases, gestational Lyme. It's up to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, present uh, some information I've gleaned over the years in uh, treating uh, children in Lyme disease from every state in America, from every province in Canada, uh, from Mexico, from Central America and South America, and uh, every continent abroad. We recently had a, a little five-year-old come in from uh, China uh, who was inflicted with Lyme there, and her parents were, uh, uh, had sufficient means to bring her here, and uh, She's being treated. But the uh, children come from every single continent and from all over North America. The, uh, sometimes in the uh, process of uh, seeing children, uh, there becomes an event in the process that's inspirational and uh, therapeutic and uh, educational. Uh, let me just describe one situation that happened not too long ago. A little boy named Timmy. Uh, Timmy, when he came into the office, he was uh, seven years old. His, uh, he had no expressive speech. His mom and dad and other people thought he had little or no receptive speech. He, uh, his mom brought him in because she found out that she had Lyme uh, four months before his coming in and that his problems might be related to her having passed organisms to him uh, in utero. Uh, she, uh, when Timmy was born, he was born obviously alive, but he had severe hypotonia, severe muscle tone weakness. He's also extremely irritable, had severe gastroesophageal reflux, uh, had light, noise, skin, hair, uh, smell, sensitivity. And he was quite impaired, but he, su he survived. He was diagnosed as having uh, uh, a, a autism spectrum disorder when he was 10 months old. Uh, that's, he had no regression in s signs and symptoms and skills. He failed to have progression. When Timmy came in, he indeed did have, he had no speech, but he's a happy little guy. He was a, a blonde, blue-eyed uh, streak of lightning. He's running around all over the office, not patterned, no stereotypical behaviors that one sees in uh, autism spectrum, but uh, his having fun running around, he gained a lot of strength over the years and running around uh, being happy and liked to be held. He had excellent eye contact. Uh, 
and his uh, his uh, blue eyes, sparkling blue, revealed that there was a, a lot inside him that was not revealed as yet. Uh, one time he came running by me and lighted in front of me, and I put my hands on his cheeks and uh, said, "I hope." I can, I have the, the key that can make you well, uh, that can uh, uh, heal your brain. And he was off running in a minute and I thought that my words just were in, in the air. His testing certainly supported the clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease and certainly his history did too and physical findings. He was placed on antibiotics and came back uh, four months later and uh, walked up to me, he didn't run up, he walked up and put my hands on his cheeks and looked me in the eye and said, thank you for giving me the key that affected my brain. And uh, his parents started, uh, uh, he hopped up on my life. He hopped up on my lap and kept saying thank you. In the meantime, his uh, one of his little arms was out reaching for something on the on the desk. Uh, he had impulsivity, which is almost a earmark characteristic of children who are born with uh, just born with uh, tick-borne diseases. But uh, he kept saying thank you. His parents started crying, and he said, "Why are they crying? This is a happy time." And uh, I said. And I said, sometimes people cry when they're happy. And we all celebrated the fact that he had part of the key that unlocked his brain. Now he's going to be on antibiotics for five, six, seven, eight years. And uh, uh, I thought his story, his story was, to me was inspirational. And, uh, and not, not, really that, not really that atypical. Uh, today I'm speaking about non-gestational Lyme disease. I've never used a computer before, <laughs> but this is going to be fun. Here we go. Get it up there. Okay. Uh, Lyme disease is a multi-system disorder caused by uh, the spirochete Burley burdorferi. This pathogen affects many parts of the body and many tissues, but has a special affinity for those tissues with collagen, and connective tissue like valves in the cardiovascular system, joints, and the nervous system, and its supporting structures. The pathogen can cause both acute and chronic disease, can go dormant for varying periods of time, wax and wane, relapse, and become chronic. Lyme affects all, age, all ages, ethnic groups, and genders. Lyme is almost always tick-borne, Almost, but not always. We know that burial infections can be transmitted in utero from mother to child, and that breast milk in infected mothers can harbor spirochetes that can be detected by PCR and grown in cultures. I've been asked to speak about gestational Lyme. Uh, it probably, how about gestational tick-borne diseases? Uh, but I want to divert for just a moment to discuss the overall extent of the Burley Burdorferi spirochete in uh, North America. This is a, a map uh, that veterinarians made in, uh, in, in Canada and in the U.S. Uh, it was donated to me by uh, Kayleen Kuntz over there, who's a uh, nurse practitioner in Maryland, who's the world's authority on uh, Pediatric Adolescent Lyme Disease and Autism in Maryland. Uh, the map is interesting. The, the darker the green, the uh, higher the incidence of uh, animals infected uh, with tick-borne diseases. Uh, as you can see, it's, there's nothing really white. There's just varying shades of green. And uh, there's one area that's uh, left out, there's white down below that's uh, Louisiana and Mississippi and, uh, and uh, two other states, Arkansas, that are loaded with Lyme. Uh, as was pointed out this morning, 
uh, that the migration of birds uh, from north to south uh, forms a wedge that uh, uh, comes in, that really settles in uh, Mississippi uh, and uh, southern Texas and Florida. And in the process of flying uh, over the Texas drop, uh, uh, the Texas drop from the birds. And on the way back, the same thing happens. We maybe you shouldn't call, call it Lyme disease, but Canada disease. <laughs> but uh, it's, we all share the same, uh, same process. But I, I was reminded by a uh, uh, physician in, in uh, infectious disease at a uh, uh, famous uh, university and teaching hospital in Canada that there's no Lyme in Canada. It's all from people who go to the U.S., who get it and then come back. And uh, the map is for his benefit. And my point to him was that all the animals who have Lyme in Canada cross the border every night and then come back every morning, and that's where they got Lyme. <laughs> he didn't think that was funny. In fact, he wanted to report me to the licensing new board, but I said, that's okay, I've already been reported. <laughs> okay.